So this is my field where I grow the squamatas. Most of them were dug up about five years ago. But when I came to this nursery in January 1986, I planted about 50 or 60 of these juniper squamata, which were no more than about, I would say, one centimeter or half an inch in diameter. And they were planted in the field. There's still some planted in the ground. If you look at the camera closely, you see that's where they're planted. And the trunks there are about five to six inches in diameter. And this is how they grow. They thicken quite fast. If left to their own devices, they can become five meters tall. That means more than 16 feet high. I have one on the nursery, which I have to keep cutting down. And over the years, I've done lots of experiments. This is the famous Peter Chan trick where I put wire around the trunk. So the wire is embedded in the trunk. That was one of the trunks, but that has slowed the rate of that. But some of the other branches, which were not wired, they grew normally. So I don't know what I'll do with this one. I will do something with it eventually because that trunk is interesting. So I've been doing lots of experiments with various things. And I also have done propagation by air layering. So all these smaller plants, all these smaller plants are air layerings from the big trees. So this is how we do them instead of just throwing them away. You see how nice the radial roots are. So from air layering, as with all junipers, it's very easy to grow. But most of these big ones have been field grown and then dug up and put in pots. Uh, so you'll just look at this one. I'm not going to put it upright, but look at the trunk of this. Come close and see. Huge trunks. And this is a typical juniper where the bark flakes up every year. And if you brush it with a brush, you get that lovely red color. So this is going to be another nice tree. So there are lots of juniper squamata here. Just endless amounts. Another air layering here. So all these are potential bonsai. But you must be wondering why I have so many of these junipers lying around. Here there's another air layering. So these are the ones that people can manage. So this is a simple one. Just wire the branches down and you've got a lovely formal upright tree. Right. To return to this question, why do I have so many here? And I'm not very keen on making junipers from this variety. Um, because it has fallen out of fashion. Although bonsai seems to be an innocuous pastime, it is almost like uh, clothes fashions and all other fashions in home decor or whatnot. And the Juniper squamata, the full name by the way, the botanical name, is Juniperus squamata meyeri, Myers juniper, M-E-Y-E-R. So the botanical name is Juniper squamata meyeri, and there is a new variety called Blue Star. I'm not sure if it is, this is Blue Star, but as you can see, it is clearly a blue juniper, not like most of the other Chinese junipers, which are red, not red. They've got red bark, but they've got green foliage, but this has got blue foliage. So this is your squamata. They make lovely bonsai. I remember when I was in the club scene, very active in the 70s and 80s. This was one of the most popular junipers for making bonsai. But ever since the late 80s, I would say, even early 90s, it has fallen out of popularity. So people don't grow this anymore. But I'm going to show you what we can do with it. Because they're mainly straight trunks, people are not interested in them. But even with the straight trunks, they make beautiful formal upright trees and uh, if you look at any of them, there is so much potential in them. But I'm going to start with some smaller ones. I'm going to do three junipers and I'm going to show you where they so are. So here are some more squamata juniper. And this I have chopped down several times. It's reached about 16, 20 feet and I keep chopping it down. And the trunk of this one must be about, I would say, like a full grown tree, at least 30 centimeters in diameter. So what I will do with this, I don't know. This is absolutely massive. So this is how the juniper squamatas grow if left unchecked. But I've just spotted here among our stock, a very interesting squamata. 
In fact, there are several school martyrs here. Let me just show you. The more I look, the more I find. This is Squamata air layering. So this has been allowed to grow, but we can do something with this. And because this is such a tall tree, I'm going to make more air layering from the top. And for those who always argue with me that many of these trees don't bud back from old wood, look at it budding from the old wood. So they do bud back from old wood and you will get young branches. So don't despair. All junipers do bud back. Now this is a very interesting one and I'm going to work on this as well. But you can see on this one, by the way, these are all these lovely ginkgo leaves. Look at this one. This is about seven, eight foot tall. And I haven't the heart to chop it down because the interest is all lying below here. So this is the tree over here. But whether to just chop that off, I don't know. But because I've got so many, I might well chop it, but I may air layer it. But we'll take this in and work on this as well. So there's, this is going to be stage two of this project. So the stage one, I will work on two simple ones, and then we will discuss this one as well. Now this one, again, it is what we would virtually call an impossible tree. Now this, as I said, are all these air layered trees. So you can see the air layering still. Unfortunately, part of the tree or part of the trunk has died away, but it's still interesting and it is going to survive. Air layerings behave in this way. You can see where it's been chopped there and the roots are formed on this side. So this air layering was probably done about maybe five years ago and then left in this pot. And we don't plant these trees in rich soil because we don't want them to grow too vigorously. Now let's see what the options are on this tree. It's got quite an interesting trunk despite it being fairly straight. These are natural looking gins. So this tree can be planted with this as a possible front. And then let's see what we can do with this. So this is just extemporizing, creating as we go along. So I won't waste time showing you how to improve the gins. It's just a question of removing the bark shortening these a bit. So I'll refine the gins later, but the main thing is to see what we can create with virtually everything there is on this plant. So this is the raw material. What do we do with that? So the first thing, if I were to give you this tree, I think you would probably chop this back portion off and just work on that and make it a literati like that. I think if we wired this to begin with, we'll see that it can be quite interesting just wiring that on its own. Let me get the correct type of wires while you have a closer look at the tree. This juniper, like most other junipers, is prone to scale insect. Scale insect are those little white 
insects that almost look like human lice and they can damage the trees very badly. But although I have so many of these growing in the field, not a single one of them has got any scale on them. So all I'm doing is putting the right grade of wire on and bending it as much as I can to shorten the branch. That's why I'm using the wire, thick wire to do this because it was sp spread all over the place. I'm just bending it. Even that looks quite interesting. I could bend it this way and see what happens there. And bend it back this way. So that's become a very plausible literati. So there are so many different things you can do to this tree. And if I wanted to, I could just remove the top and just keep uh, a little bit. Let me bring a bag. So if we didn't want to use that bit, we could keep the tree short like this and just keep the tree this size and make a nice literati that way. But that is also a very plausible literati. Now let's see what we can do if we did this. So this is how you would practice it. You know, just try different positions and see what you think works best. That is possible. So that's another style of doing the tree. So it just shows you the different options you have in making this tree. So I won't spend more time on this because you can see what I can do. But I'm going to pot this up and then I will show you the final pictures. Again, this is another air layering. All the air layerings don't have these massive thick roots. So that's the beauty of air layering. And as I mentioned to you before, all junipers have this flaky bark which you can take off and clean. And again, this is a simple one. Find the front, find the leader, and hey presto, you've got it. And because many people like carving, this is a subject for carving, should you want to carve it. But my uh, thoughts on carving is that please don't carve just for the sake of carving. I see too much of this. Ever since Kimura came into this bonsai world, uh, everyone has been obsessed with carving and you get these people like apes, literally aping, copying Kimura and carving. And they carve trees just for the sake of carving. And that I think is wrong. What Mr. Kimura does, he is an artist and he is the greatest sculptor in the world of uh, bonsai trees. And people are carving just to uh, do it, as I say, just for the heck of it. And that is the wrong approach. Carving should be appropriate to the tree. If it's not appropriate, then it doesn't suit. It's amazing what wire can do to transform a bush into a bonsai. I reckon without the use of wire, it would be very, very difficult to achieve any thing of substance in bonsai. There, bring it around the back like that, make the apex so. I'll leave the end so that it can grow a little more. If I tip it, it will send side shoots growing. Now this is a possible front. Now because there's a little stub there where I cut the top off, you could have carved that, made a little gin, or you can carve the front this way and make the branches hang this way. That's also a possibility. There's so many possibilities. So you can use this as the front. You don't have to have this as the front. So there are many, many possible fronts to this tree. So the next video is going to be uh, 
a shot of the tree complete and put in its pot and I will show that later. Meanwhile, I'll go to that other big tree, which is part two. So as you can see, this is a beast of a tree. It must weigh every bit 300 kilos, I reckon. This pot is about more than two foot in diameter. And let's look at the tree. All these lovely ginkgo leaves because it was growing under a ginkgo tree. And while it's at this angle, you see it's got lovely twists and bends. Uh, the side branches here can make a leader. So it only needs to be a short tree. The rest of that, as I say, I will decide what to do after I've styled the bottom part. And if we look at it from every side, before we put it on the turntable, you see that there's endless possibilities there. Okay, so the next shot, uh, I'm going to put it on the turntable, so we switch the camera off for a while. So let's look at this tree from every angle to see what the options are. So our resident Robin keeps coming here to say hello. I love the twist of that trunk. Beautiful twist. So you could possibly even make that the leading shoot, but it seems a sh shame to waste this part. So this, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, if we wanted to make it a big tree, you could even use the whole height here and make this the leader using these as the branches. So that is one possibility. But I think the beauty is really in the trunk here. See how the trunk sweeps here. So that's what we should aim to capitalize. So there's, a, I think there's a case for making all this gin, gin all this, and just use this part and the back part. It's quite a major decision. So I think we need to use this part and emphasize that as much as possible. That's very straight. As I said, we could air layer it. If I didn't want to, I can air layer it. But let's see. As I say, I've got so many. What does one air layering make? Not much of a difference. So this is an instance where even I have to be a bit cautious and not take any hasty decisions because there is so much potential here that one hasty decision can spoil the tree. So normally a tree like this, in the past I have sometimes spent days, weeks, maybe even years. I remember whenever I used to have a difficult tree, I used to keep it in a prominent place where I walk past it. So every time I walk past it, I say to myself, what can I do with that tree? And that is how the ideas come to my head. So although you may see me working tr on trees very fast and taking quick decisions, sometimes there is a case for contemplating and taking your time in deciding what to do. So I love that beautiful twist. And of course, the squamatas are very uh, useful to doing these spiral gins. There is no obvious leader on this part at this junction. Over there, there is. And this part is very straight. So if I use the straight part, the beauty of the lower part, which is twisted, 
will be wasted. Wind up. So let's return to this tree and see uh, where we've got to. You should always stand far back because when you stand far back you get the overall impression of the design. If you're too close you will lose sight of the overall shape. So what we call in business the strategic view. You've always got to take a strategic view. So looking at it from the back, if I stand back and look at it, I can see straight away that although I didn't want to make a big tree, the big tree is still a possibility. It will look very nice because of the curve. I said that this part is a bit straight, but there's some curve. So I might even keep the tree that high and keep the tree like this, this size. So that is an option. So the way I'm going to do this is to wire more, wire much more, and then decide what the options are. So there's some more wiring to do. I'm going to wire these branches, wire these branches down, uh, tidy up the wiring there, and I'll decide what to do with that, and then probably uh, do something to the top there. So that's the plan of work. So I'm just showing you what we've done so far. We've removed all the bark from that top part. Just removing the bark and uh, very roughly doing the gins. We'll see if it works. If it doesn't work, then we'll discard it. And then we'll assess the tree again. Right, here we are. We're going to take this out of the pot and try and pot it. I think it's heavy, isn't it? God. There you are. Okay, so now it is just growing in ordinary mud, and we're going to do a bit of scraping of the soil which is a tedious process. So, so much talk about bonsai compost. Uh, right, bonsai compost has its place but it just shows that because plants and trees grow naturally, this is just ordinary garden soil and the, the tree has grown so well in it. So, sometimes I'm tempted to plant our bonsai in this medium. I know it's not ideal, but it won't say that the tree won't grow. But the tree will grow better in bonsai soil because we will have provided more drainage and we can control uh, the moisture content better. So don't be disappointed if you can't get bonsai soil. That's the point I'm trying to make. I know people will criticize me for everything, but I like to give honest opinions and tips, things that have worked for me. So I won't show you too much of this tedious task. The next stage will be when we've taken a lot of the soil off and testing it in its uh, temporary training pot. Look at the lovely rich black soil that we have. Although I say this is ordinary garden soil, but a lot of our garden soil has a lot of natural leaf mold and compost, hence the black color. So this tree has been in the pot for probably only about three years. So we can see the extent of the root there are some big roots and I'm going to see how much root there is before I decide what I can cut off. 
I don't want to stress the tree too much. Remember that every time you cut roots, it does stress the tree. So th the least amount of root I can cut away, the better for the tree. And we would gradually reduce the amount of root over a period of time, maybe of over a period of two years. The main thing is to reduce the root ball to get it into a temporary bonsai training pot. And since we are now almost the third week in November, it's quite safe to do it. And here's our little robin, our resident robin. Follows us everywhere. Inquisitive fellow. Okay, we will stop for a while while I examine the roots. I'm really pleased that there's such a lot of fibrous roots. This is what we call the fibrous roots, like that. That are what we call the feeding roots or the feeder roots. And that's what we want to keep. The thick roots are not that important. Some of the thick roots are in fact, I think, slightly rotten. And I dare say they may have died. But we have a lot of very nice healthy root. So we'll now try and see if it can fit one of these pots. These are plastic bonsai pots, really nice pots. Okay, Steve, if you can kindly try and lift it. It should be lighter now, it shouldn't feel so heavy. We're just going to test it to see if it fits. It's not the final potting, because the final potting could be in a slightly shallower pot. In fact, I'm just wondering if we can get it into a drum pot of some kind. Now, there's a very thick root here, which seems redundant. Just hang on there. I'll just get the big loppers. Okay, we can now shift it to this side, Steve. Ah, but the tree should be the other way around. So we've decided to use this round mica pot, drum pot, and because we can mound the soil, this pot is perfectly adequate. There'll be enough room, and all the roots we've taken off are these two little bits. That's all we've taken off. So that should be Okay, so I'm going to get Steve to prepare this micropod. We need to tie two pairs of quite thick wire, maybe like three mil wire or three and a half, to steady the tree. And then I will show you how we pot it up. So we take it out of the thing again. Okay, we will now prepare the pot with some heavy wire. So because it's a heavy tree, we're using three mil wire to tie the tree in. We're using two pairs. Talking of pots, I'll just show you some of the pots we use. These are what we call shallow uh, flower pots. Normal flower pots are much deeper, but we buy a lot of these very shallow pots. That one is one meter in diameter, that pot, huge pot, but it's a shallow pot, and that's what we use for training our field-grown trees in. This, of course, is a huge, I would say, that's almost a 60 centimeter size Japanese training pot from Tokonami. I used to buy quite a lot of these. And they are not cheap. You think that they're ordinary flower pots, not so. They are made specifically for bonsai with large drainage holes and tying holes. And uh, this is also another training pot, very large plastic training pot. 
pots, bonsai training pots, so we have quite a selection of pots. We're very fond of using mica pots because they're indestructible and they look the part from a distance. You can't tell whether it's ceramic or mica. So we prepared the pot now and we're now going to put the tree in. So the next stage is we're going to use a mixture of soils. So let's begin. So I'm going to reveal you some more secrets of how we transition the tree from ordinary flower pots with garden soil to a bonsai training pot. So this is our sphagnum moss. I'm pleased to say that these supplies of moss we now get is not from New Zealand. They're sourced from uh, somewhere in the UK. I think this is a Welsh supplier. It comes from Wales, so not so far to travel. So I'm putting moss there because I believe that moss has these magical properties that has maybe enzymes and can really encourage the tree to send out roots. So if we lift this tree, can you lift that tree? It should be a bit lighter. So the base is going to sit on the moss as central as possible. More this way. Okay, so that tree is central. I'm not too worried about the soil popping up because I'm going to do this over a period of two years. So initially it'll be a bit proud, but then in a couple of years time when we repot it, we can cut some of those thick roots at the bottom. So I'm letting the moss touch the roots so that they send out more roots. And I may even use some of the old soil, but I may mix it with some of our standard bonsai soil. I may use our standard bonsai soil because I think I've got enough of the original soil around the roots. So this is our standard bonsai mix, which is a secret formula of uh, pine bark, uh, then the moss peat equivalent, akadama, Japanese volcanic grit, two types of Japanese volcanic grit goes in there. So this is the texture of our bonsai compost. Look at that, beautiful stuff. Okay, so now that we've put the moss around, I will uh, start putting some of the soil in. A lot of soil. And once I put some soil, I will then get Steve to tie the tree in with the wire. Will this root come this side a bit? Without breaking it? Okay. Will the root at the bottom come this way? Okay. Cross it from here. Okay, then if we tighten it with the gene pliers a bit.
rest is just firming the soil in and the tree should be able to stand up on its own. Let me just check the angle before we firm it too much. Firm it in from this angle. Just by propping it up and forcing the soil and ramming the soil in, we can get it to sit in the correct angle that we wish. Amazing how much soil is used for a tree of this size. Okay. I'll So that looks much more like a bonsai now. And although I haven't removed the top, I'm going to keep the top on in case you're wondering why I've left it. As many of you will know by now, because we are a commercial nursery, sometimes you've got to go with what the customers like. What I may like may not be what other people like. This was a hard lesson I learned many, many years ago. When I used to go to Japan back in the late 80s and early 1990s, I never used to like buying satsuki azaleas because I personally didn't like satsuki azalea. I didn't like flowering trees. I only liked maples and maybe junipers. But my wife used to keep telling me that you've got to buy azaleas because a lot of people will like it. And I'm glad I did listen to her eventually, but this is where different people have different tastes and usually women's intuition is very uh, right, and she was proved right. And uh, satsukis are now one of our very popular trees, and so are most of the other flowering trees. So coming back to the point about why I left the gin, someone who may want to buy this tree eventually will like the gin, and he'll keep it and do what they like with it. So I'm keeping it. But my preference would be to keep the tree this high and then work with the tree as if the top didn't exist. So I'll, this is how I'm going to work with the tree. And if I just could turn the tree around and refresh your memory. I started off with the tree with this as the possible front of the tree. This is like a false little head here. But I decided that the other side looks more attractive. Again, different people will have different views. I need to tidy up a little more. I'm going to remove a few more of these branches. There's far too much going on here. And I've wrapped this round to make a spiral. So that's another feature which could turn out to be interesting. If this is too much, I may even take this up this way. Uh, so we will see. So this is the future direction of the tree and I'm just going to refine it a little more uh, rather than do it behind your back. I will just show you I'm not going to hide anything. I think it's too cluttered. I'm going to remove that branch. There's far too much here, far too much going on. That can go to the back, that could go to the back. If I could use it, I will keep it. These have to be thin quite a lot before I do the final wiring. I'm just going to do more wiring, which is really quite a tedious thing to show you. Endless wiring, but these will all be wired. Wired, and then you will see the refined tree in the next shot. 